open to prime time. We'll get started. Um, I just want to point out we do have coffee and pastries in the back if, if you're interested in those, uh, having a little something to eat while we uh, have our, listen to this presentation. So I want to welcome you to prime time. Prime time at the BU Library is a designed to cel celebrate the experiences and accomplishments of the Bethel faculty, students, and staff. It is a collaborative project between the Friends of the Bethel Library, faculty development, and other offices on campus. Uh, most presentations are recorded and can be found in the BU Digital Library. So be sure to check out the library's news and events webpage and the BU calendar for what's coming up on the schedule. On Thursday, April 14th, we hope you can join us as we celebrate National Poetry Month with a special program of poetry reading and, and song uh, by students, staff, and faculty members of the Bethel community. Today, we want to welcome Dr. Wade Nywert, Professor of Chemistry, and uh, who co-led uh, the Bethel Study Rod Interim Course, History of Science in Europe, uh, with Dr. Trey Maddox, uh, Associate Professor of Chemistry. Hopefully, Trey will be able to join us later uh, in the presentation. Uh, and joining with them are two students, Zoe Vermeer, a, a senior in the Political Science and Communication Studies, and Max Werner, a uh, junior in Physics and Mathematics. And together they will share their stories and highlights from their interim history of science in Europe, of course. Please welcome them. So thank you, Christina, and thank you guys for coming and uh, hearing about uh, a little bit about what we do on the history of science. So I just want to introduce uh, sort of the course, what we do, where we go, uh, and then I want to turn it over to, to Zoe and Max and have them actually tell you a little bit about what they did and sort of what they experienced and what that impact had on sort of their education and their, uh, and their faith. Um, so uh, I put a few pictures here uh, just to give you some sense of sort of the diversity of what we do in the course. Uh, so the central picture here is actually one of John Harrison's clocks that you can see at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Uh, so this was one of the clocks that was used to sort of figure out how to determine longitude for uh, explorers at sea uh, or merchants at sea. Um, over on the right-hand side is uh, Michelangelo's Pietà, which is in St. Peter's Basilica uh, in uh, the Vatican City in Rome. Uh, and then over on the left uh, is actually the doors uh, that are the entrance to the old uh, <coughs> Cavendish laboratories at Cambridge University uh, in Cambridge, England. Uh, and so these sort of fit sort of a good overview of the things we do uh, in the class. We look at a lot of art, we look at a lot of scientific instruments and sort of how they fit in the context of science and how they fit into those discoveries. Uh, but I really like, you might wonder like, why the heck did you put a door up there? Well, on the doors, uh, which were uh, inscribed in Latin, you can sort of see a little bit there, and they were open so I couldn't get the other door in the picture. Uh, is inscribed part of Psalm 111, uh, and so translated, because it's in Latin and I'm not going to attempt to read that, uh, it says, uh, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all of them that have pleasure therein, uh, right, and this is the entrance into a laboratory, uh, and so I think it's fitting that Bethel students were thinking about how their faith interacts with uh, all their aspects of their life uh, in a course like this, uh, that that sort of fits in well. Uh, with the kinds of things that we're doing and trying to uh, um, uh, impart. <laughs> Zoe says she's glad this happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> So well, what I was going to show you while I try to sort of fix this uh, is uh, one of the things that I did uh, during the course that was new this year uh, was I kept a blog, uh, which I had not done before. Um, there we go. Let's see if we can get this to actually show up. Find my mouse. Uh, so I kept a blog. Uh, and so if you wanted to look at that, uh, you certainly could. Um, Okay. 
There it is. Good yep, there you are. There we are. Excellent. So the trip goes smoother than this. Uh, uh, all right, so uh, so I kept a blog, so you can see the address there if you want to write it down and, and take a look. Uh, so I just gave you a couple excerpts here. Uh, so some of the things I wrote about to sort of tell family, friends, coworkers, uh, former students that are sort of tracking along and remembering their experiences. Um, so I find that I have sort of favorite places to go to eat in all of these cities now that I've done this a long time. Uh, so this was one of our favorite uh, gelato. Uh, places in Rome, just near the Pantheon. Um, uh, one of the things you'd sort of think is weird to take a picture of, but I started taking a bunch of pictures of uh, our class experiences and sort of what this was like. So this was one of our classes. Uh, this would have been in Paris, actually. Uh, so we sort of cram all into a hotel room and call it classroom uh, and sort of do some things there. Uh, and then we go to a lot of different kinds of museums, whether it's art museums, science museums, so I'll let Zoe and Max sort of tell you more about that. Uh, but this was the uh, Bletchley Park where uh, the uh, codes during World War II were broken. Uh, so we spent some time there uh, at that museum. Um, so there's lots of different experiences that, that, uh, that students have, uh, lots of different things that we do. So if you want to see some more specific examples of that, go to the website, uh, read about the blog. But I'm going to let Zoe and Max tell you the more specific aspects of sort of what they got out of this trip. Hello. Okay, so quick question for the students here. How many of you guys are here because you're thinking of going on the trip? Okay. Just wanted to see what it was who's in the room. Um, so a little bit about me, Zoe Vermeer. I am a junior political science communication double major. Just added a history minor because I realized I only needed one more class, so why not? Um, and I went on the trip because my freshman year I went abroad to China and I loved it. And so this whole J term trip was like it's the perfect amount of time to go abroad. Three weeks you're with like, a certain amount of students, and so you get really close to the students you're with. And so I just I'm a big fan of the study abroad trip, so I wanted to go again, and so I looked for K courses, and this was the most inexpensive K course, and that's why I went, um, in all honesty. But I learned a lot. Um, and so before you go on the trip, we had three textbooks that we had to learn. One, which was called uh, God in the Lab, and it was by Ruth Van Witt. It, the last one is, is difficult. Um, and she taught, she has this chapter on beauty and what is beauty in science. And she goes into a couple different things, which I'll touch on later. Um, and right away, my, my intrigue was kind of piqued with this idea of beauty because I was trying to see, well, how would political science see beauty and what would we coin as being beautiful? Um, and then beauty continued to surface throughout the trip. And so I, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about where beauty kind of emerged. So first is kind of the obvious one, beauty in nature. Uh, so here on um, the top we have a picture of Rome, Italy, but really clouds in the centerpiece. <coughs> I love clouds, and this was a day where we had walked like 15 miles because we were trying to find uh, Peter and Chains, and we never found it. Um, but we, at the end of the day, we got it. We had we walked up this building because we had to use a restroom, and there was three public restrooms in the building. So we walked up, and then afterwards we looked out, and it was just like the beautiful sunset. You could see the city; it was, it was beautiful. Um, and then in the bottom you have Latterbrun, Switzerland. Uh, in the mountains we spent a whole day. Some people skied and snowboard. I did not. I had never skied or snowboard before and decided that the Swiss Alps was not a good first chance to try it out. Um, so I just like explored the ski towns and they were beautiful. It was snowy and the mountains were gorgeous. And the temperature was not below zero. Like it was probably here. So that was really nice. Um, but there's also beauty and discovery. So we went to CERN, which to be very honest, I left more confused than when I entered the place. Um, but I know some people were really excited about it. And there's this idea of beauty that occurs when you're discovering new things. So here is a group of students, none of which are physics majors. And I promised them it would never appear on social media. So don't tell them you saw this. It's in front of the antimatter factory again. Not really sure what happened there. But just you can tell you're in a very important place. So that was exciting. Um, also, there's beauty and art. So here's two different types of art here on the left. You have the inception of the artwork, the picture of the art. We have the Mona Lisa in the background and the lace maker by Vermeer. Both of these are at the Louvre. Um, we went to multiple different um, 
art museums throughout our trip, seeing the connection between art and science and finding beauty just in art in many different ways. Um, you can also see beauty in architecture. So here you have the Eiffel Tower. Uh, I was just so blown away by the Eiffel Tower because it's such an <laughs> iconic symbol that you don't expect, like you just see it everywhere. Um, but really it is beautiful. I mean, you, you see it, you're kind of blown away by just the tallness and the vastness, and it's in a park that which really nothing stands still, so it really stands out to you. So it is just a beautiful structure. And then you also have the Roman Forum here on the left. I think Rome was my favorite city we went to because I loved the Roman Forum. We spent a whole day there. It's right across from the Colosseum, and um, the architect there is beautiful, and to think of that, and this was happening so many years ago, was great. Uh, we also found beauty in technology. So here we have, uh, we went to the BMW Museum, which was great. This is the second time I had been, um, but I had never been through the actual museum before. And to see the progression of technology was really cool. And BMW has captivated it really well. Um, and then we also went to the Museum of Arts and Crafts in uh, Paris, which is the best translation we have. Um, but you see the progression of bikes. Again, it's just very beautiful to see it all. Um, and so, as you can see, beauty was just a reoccurring theme throughout our trip, and you could pull different things uh, from beauty. Um, and so what did I do? I decided to tie this to political science, because everything in the world can and should be tied to political science. <laughs> and so as I continue to process this idea of beauty and how it relates to natural science and how it relates to political science, I came upon this thesis, which was, my paper, which was the thesis for my paper, uh, at the end of the trip. And so my thesis is this, natural science sees or understands beauty to be the way the world is. Political science sees or understands beauty to be the way the world ought to be. And so um, starting with beauty and the natural science, so as Ruth spelled out in her book, beauty can be revealed in objects of study such as molecules, organisms, the stars in the sky, but you can also see beauty in a clearly devised experiment. There's something beautiful about starting and ending an experiment and working your way through the process to a discovery, or maybe the lack of a discovery. Uh, but there's also beauty in elegantly drawn graphs and models. Um, and so beauty can be seen in a lot of different areas of natural science. Uh, but I also claim that beauty can be found in political science. And maybe political scientists have never termed these things as beautiful, so it might be a stretch, but it's a stretch I'm going to make and try and convince you of today. So I focus on two main ways to uh, describe beauty or that beauty can be seen in the field of political science. First is seeing beauty and justice. Uh, seeing justice as pleasing or something that governments or systems of government strive for. And so although political science may not agree on what justice is or the ideal form of justice, I'm going to tackle two today. The first being Mills' utilitarian theory of justice. Seeing justice as a part of morality. Um, justice is more or has less to do with uh, anything but other moral concerns. And so justice is only the things that someone has, not only has the, justice is not only the things that someone has the right to do or should, shouldn't do, but so, the things that someone has a moral claim to. That's one theory of justice. Another is Rawls' is justice is fairness. And this theory is literally grounded in an ideal thought experiment known as the original position. And here, this is the idea where people can place themselves under the veil of ignorance in which they will always act with self-interest. But while people are in this original position, people uh, will act in a way that benefits the least, the, the least advantage. Uh, and from there, he pulls two different theories of justice, which we can discuss more later if you want. Don't have a lot of time to go in, but I'd love to talk to you about it, so come hang out. <laughs> the last is this idea of beauty in the peaceable kingdom, and this uh, I pulled from probably one of the most influential political scientists of my life, who's Stacey Hunter Hecht. Um, so I'm going to read a section of Isaiah. Isaiah 11, the wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and the little child will lead them, the cow will feed with the bear, the young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, the young will put its, head, its hand to the viper's nest. They will neither destroy nor harm on the holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so I'm going to read a section of my paper that just kind of ties this to the peaceful kingdom. So within these verses, 
lie a description of our world, a world in which there will always be a wolf and a lamb, the powerful and the weak, the fierce and the gentle, the proud and the humble. But there is more. Within these verses, we see that there is a kingdom, a kingdom where the wolf and the lamb lie down together, the lion and the ox stand side by side, and where even the baby is safe next to the poisonous snake. In political science terms, a kingdom exists where the power and the powerlessness no longer clash against one another, but rather live in a gracious harmony. This is beauty, and this is how political science sees the way the world ought to be. So from there in my paper, I talk about how uh, beauty, both within natural science and within political science, point us to something outside of ourselves. And they even point us to a creator. And when we understand beauty or we explore beauty within these two disciplines, we understand different um, characteristics of our creator. And then I also touch on where beauty can be lost or forgotten, and where brokenness of humanity taints the way we see beauty or the way we see beauty is or, way, or the way we sort of see beauty as it ought to be in the world. And finally, I conclude with this. Together, understanding beauty from both natural science and political science can give us a broader understanding of our world, of who we are, and who God is. So what this trip taught me, I think the number one lesson that I come from, that I come away with is, uh, if you look at a concept such as beauty, it can cross cultures, and if you analyze it, um, a concept such as beauty that may be seen as overused or ordinary, but you dive deeper into it, um, it's a concept that can sh be shaped by and also shape our disciplines. And it's a concept that also shapes and is shaped by different cultures. And from there, if we learn that, we can learn how these cultures relate to us as individuals. My name is Max. Uh, I am a physics and math double major. I'm um, a sophomore now this year. Um, so I thought that I would start off uh, just saying a little bit about why I went on this trip, um, some of the highlights that I had, and some of the big uh, ideas that I learned while I was there. Um, <clears throat> so to start, uh, in Italy, one of the highlights that I had was really, or sorry, I'll start with why I went on the trip. Um, I really and passionate about science, and that's why I'm a physics major, and I really also enjoy history and kind of understanding how the two fit together. Um, so this trip was a great excuse to get to explore that, um, and just to learn more about that. Also, it's a great way to take care of a gen ed, um, and just a great change of pace from the classroom. Uh, so some of the highlights, uh, starting in Italy, just feeling really deeply connected to that history. Um, seeing things like the Colosseum or the Pantheon um, or the Vatican, and also learning at the same time about how science is starting um, in these civilizations. Uh, and then going ahead uh, to CERN in Switzerland, where there's the big uh, particle accelerator, and being able to see that progression of science uh, to these really modern uh, cutting edge discoveries. Um, also in Switzerland, sort of taking a break from all the academics, uh, getting out on the mountain, and really just enjoying the beauty of God's creation was just a great part of this trip. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorite parts also was being able to see the art museums throughout the trip, especially in Paris, um, and being able to see the culture that goes along with that and how science has influenced that and how that influences science. Um, and finally, in, uh, in Cambridge, seeing the Cavendish Laboratory, all the history that goes with that, the great scientists that have uh, studied and worked there, and all the Nobel Prizes that have been won there, uh, it was just great to see that history, too. Um, so some of the big ideas, then, are all, or some of the highlights that I have are all tied together um, by what I felt I learned. Uh, so seeing sort of this deep history of science um, that, we, that we saw in Italy, and then seeing uh, cutting edge science in, at CERN, um, and seeing this progression, and just uh, really seeing that history was a big thing uh, for me in affirming that. Um, also then remembering uh, the beauty of God's creation in Switzerland, um, and also seeing sort of science and culture tied together through different art museums. Um, and also 
another big thing that I feel I learned is uh, science in our society seems to have just a lot of triumphs. And we see all the triumphs of technology and all the, um, all the things that make our life easier. But also looking back through history, there are a lot of mistakes that are made in science. Um, and it's, it's a field studied by humans, just like every other field, we make mistakes. Um, and it's not the only way to truth. Uh, so I think we sort of need to look outside of science then to uh, really ground ourselves and look for truth that way and make sure that we're practicing, our, uh, practicing science responsibly. Um, and so then that sort of moves into what I researched for my paper and uh, what I really got interested in on the trip. Um, and that is science and art. So science and culture are really deeply connected um, just in, in how they influence each other, in uh, how they reflect each other. So uh, the paper I wrote about was uh, on art. Um, and it said, art being a reflection of the society and ideas of a time is an essential tool for attaining the connection between science and humanity. Through artistic expression, we are able to realize and reflect upon the impacts of science, allowing for a more responsible use of our knowledge. Uh, and so then I think that art can really uh, allow us to see any dangerous ideas or trends in science and just to reflect upon how science might impact society. Um, so first I'll go into a little bit of how I see uh, science reflected in art. And we'll start uh, in, during the Renaissance. Um, so sort of the where, it started, where, our, where our trip started um, in Italy. And things like this, uh, like Da Vinci's sketch here, show this focus in art on, the, on realism, uh, sort of the rationality. Um, and you see here Da Vinci playing with proportions. Um, I think that uh, reflects science well in that at this time, uh, science is really starting in Italy during the Renaissance. Um, and there's a focus shifting towards this realism and this rationality in nature. Um, moving ahead a little bit um, to the Impressionists, um, this is taking place during uh, great advances in optics and sort of this investigation into light. Um, and what the artists are doing is playing around with how the human eye actually sees the world. Um, and it's obviously the painting looks a little blurry, but this is sort of a reflection of how uh, how the how human vision is sort of limited in uh, focus, um, and then also how light reflects differently as, as things move throughout the world. So, uh, so yeah, and then moving ahead a little bit further uh, to uh, the 20th century and artists like Picasso who are um, playing around with dimensions and how we see the world and also sort of this chaos and uncertainty. And all of this is taking place around the same time that the world wars are happening. Um, that scientific discoveries like the uncertainty principle and quantum mechanics are happening, and it's all sort of a reflection of that. Um, <clears throat> so that's sort of how I see science and art tied together. But then the question is, well, how can art like impact science and impact uh, those ideas that that science brings about? Um, so this painting by Joseph Wright uh, is a depiction of a man experimenting on a bird and showing the necessity of uh, oxygen for us to breathe and live. And so you can see uh, a few different reactions in this painting. Uh, you might see there's fear, some, some people look indifferent or uh, concerned, or there's maybe some awe. And it's all, I think it points us back to really reflect on, like science impacts people, how like, we have to think about how it's going to impact people um, and really reflect on whether we should be doing what we're doing in science. Um, and then something like this, uh, Seurat's Sunday on the Grand Chat. Um, this is post-impressionist. So the impressionists, like I'd shown before, focused on that scientific aspect of how we see the world. And now the post-impressionists are getting back to sort of the spiritual side of things. Um, and you can see there's still sort of that same style, but there's also these figures are very solid and the shadows seem very permanent. Um, it's, it seems very well structured. And so this is sort of pointing back to a permanence in, uh, in spiritual life. Um, and just while it still acknowledges this scientific discovery, it reminds us that there is something outside of that. Um, and then also a bit more modern, um, and this being painted right around the uh, time of World War II, <clears throat> and 
and all this chaos uh, brings us back to two simple planes. You've got a horizontal plane uh, alluding to sort of uh, humanity, and you've got a vertical plane alluding to the divine. And there's this real uh, stability and structure in this idea. And so I think in a time where uh, the world is so chaotic and science is, is uh, bringing about these new ideas of uncertainty, this is a very important idea. Um, so really then, uh, I think those are some of the big ideas that I learned. We have to look outside of science um, to really ground ourselves again. Um, but then also to tie this in to uh, faith, I think it's easy as a science major to really get lost in the details of what you're studying. Um, there's a lot of complexity to it. Um, I think what this trip allowed me to do was to really take a step back uh, from that and enjoy the beauty of what I'm studying um, and tying that into other, other cultures and other fields. Um, also, it allowed me to see through a lot of our discussions, uh, science as a way of pursuing God and really seeking to know him through uh, his creation. So I think that's now really a huge motivation for me. Um, but also, then, also we need to be responsible with the scientific knowledge that we have. Um, and I think considering it in this broad perspective across cultures and throughout different societies, um, being able to look at that and see how that has progressed um, allowed me to better understand uh, how to really evaluate where scientific discovery is going and how it can be utilized. Um, and then just using that knowledge to further God's kingdom is a big motivation for my studies now. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, it's, science is not the whole truth. Um, it's part of the story, but it's also part of a culture and society and it's influenced by that. So I think it's important to remember that. If there are any questions, we've got a few minutes left. We've got maybe uh, 10 or 12 minutes left. If you guys have any questions uh, for Zoe, for Max, or for myself, we'd be happy to sort of entertain those, tell you some more details or stories. So, uh, so I've never had a loss of not talking about this class, I think. <laughs> so everybody had to write a paper? All yep. Okay. And they got to choose? Yeah, so the way we set up the paper uh, is that it was uh, a topic of their own choice, which some students really like and some students absolutely abhor. Uh, but it had to relate, uh, it had to have a scientific component, uh, and it had to integrate at least two of the texts that either they read or that we read as a class. So, uh, so like Zoe mentioned, that we read three different books, two books everybody reads, and then students pick a third of their own choosing uh, that fit in with their topic that they lead discussion on at some point in the course. Yes. So the course is called History of Science in Europe. And for information sake, you offer this every interim? Every so other? it's offered every interim. I'm not always the instructor of record uh, every interim, but most interims, I would say. So I've led it. Uh, we've been teaching it since 2008. I think I've done it six times. I'm leading it this coming January. So, uh, so Trey Maddox is, uh, was the person who co-taught it with me this last year, uh, also a chemistry professor. Uh, so he's off teaching right now, uh, doing his job. Uh, and then uh, Ken Rowley in the chemistry department, Keith Stein in the physics department, who's also taught it, uh, and Barrett Fisher, uh, former English professor, one of our administrators, uh, has taught it. So uh, there's been sort of a number of different people involved. And my father-in-law, who's a pastor in, uh, in the state of Washington, has taught it with me. So. <laughs> Did you meet uh, any scientists or artists? So did we meet any, well, uh, so the author of the God in the Lab is actually one of our speakers. So she is, uh, she is a researcher, uh, she's a biologist, but also uh, works for the Faraday Institute, which is an institute at Cambridge University that studies the integration of science and faith. So there's a really large community at Cambridge uh, interested in continuing and furthering the conversation between science and faith and thinking about how they complement each other and it really ties in well with sort of the, the goals of the course. Uh, and Ruth has been our contact uh, at the Faraday Institute. So she actually gave a talk on beauty uh, and sort of uh, her, her, the book that we read uh, as part of the course. So, uh, so we got to talk to Ruth. Um, 
Uh, in terms of sort of historians of science, uh, we work with a woman by the name of uh, Karen Giacobasi uh, in Florence, and she's really become sort of our contact there, uh, and has helped us to get into some places and do some things there. So uh, she gives us a tour through the Galileo Museum. So I don't know if we can show any pictures of the Galileo Museum. That's probably my favorite museum that we go to. Uh, and then uh, she also took us through the uh, Natural History Museum in Florence, where we look at wax models from the 1700s and 1800s of uh, human cadavers, sort of what would have been, are still used actually to study uh, anatomy, uh, looking at veins and arteries and skeletal structure and muscle structure. So, uh, so those are a couple examples of sort of people that we connect with and talk to. Yes? How many days did you spend in each country? So we typically leave on the 1st of January. We came back on the 26th, is that right? So we're there usually about 25, 26 days. So it's about three and a half weeks. So it's a busy, it's a, it's a busy three and a half weeks. So I think we do seven cities uh, in three and a half weeks. So lots of jumping from city to city. Uh, you know, it, it's contrasted a little bit with some of the other interim courses. Um, for instance, uh, Harley Schreck's course on the urban church that he sometimes teaches in Amsterdam. They stay in Amsterdam for the whole uh, entirety of their three and a half weeks and they really get to know Amsterdam well. Uh, we travel around and go to a bunch of different places so students get a really good overview of a lot of different places in Western Europe. So, um, so it changes from year to year, sort of some of the cities we go to. We went to Padua this year in Italy and went to the University of Padua. Um, Karen came up and as sort of our guide through there. Uh, Galileo was a professor at the University of Padua in mathematics, so I uh, got to see some things associated with that. So, uh, But a lot of things are, are pretty similar from year to year. Questions. You guys have questions for the students on their perspective. What was your favorite physics thing that you learned or saw? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you too. Like so. <laughs> um, well, I mean, CERN was awesome. So I think uh, well, Billy may not have enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think we only got to tour the antimatter factory, so learning about um, uh, anti, they were working with anti electrons, um, or sorry, anti protons. Anti -protons. Yes. Um, and actually, they were actually able to uh, replace an electron. What kind of atoms? So they were looking at hydrogen. They started with hydrogen. Hydrogen, yeah. so they replaced an electron with an anti proton. And, I had no idea that was even going on. So I think it was cool to just see how much is actually going on in particle physics. Um, <coughs> so that was just a small part of what they're doing. And learning about how they, like, their data is open to all, to the whole world. So and just all the, all the databases that they have to store that. So that's kind of crazy. Yeah, CERN is one of those interesting places that I think my physics and engineering students typically are excited about. They've heard about it. Uh, um, I really like going there, but I think uh, from Zoe's perspective, sort of, it's it's really it's over my head. Uh, it's over many of our students' heads. Um, but it's one of those things that some students don't even know why we're going there. Is this a museum? What are we doing? We're touring this lab. I don't get it. Uh, maybe they've read about it. Dan Bram writes about it in Angels and Demons. So I often refer students to that book or the movie if they want to take the shortcut. Uh, uh, and there are some things that he got right and some things he got wrong. Uh, they do have a little ocular scanner to get down into the, uh, the LHC. But uh, um, I think what most students leave, uh, not having knowing sort of what to expect or anything, is a sense of awe or that it was actually a lot cooler than sort of what they thought. We actually got to meet with a Bethel grad, a uh, physics grad, uh, is working there uh, and uh, has sort of a research group that he coordinates there. So we had lunch with him and, uh, and chatted with him while we were at CERN. So that was fun to sort of make that Bethel connection. So. Any other questions? So, well, I thank you guys for coming. Uh, if you want to chat with Zoe or Max or some of our other students that were on the trip are here as well. Uh, they'll stick around maybe for a few minutes and ask them some other questions. But thank you guys for coming. <laughs>